If you haven't been living under a rock for decades, then chances are that you've heard of the ozone hole. In order to gain a deeper understanding, let's begin at the most fundamental concepts. Ozone is a molecule made up of three oxygen atoms, typically only existing between 10 and 35 kilometers above sea level. The ozone layer is at its densest at about 26 kilometers up. It filters out about 99% of the sun's harmful UV rays. While it does extend across a range of 25 kilometers, the layer itself is actually quite thin. If we brought all of the ozone to ground level, it would be about 3 millimeters thick, reducing to just 1 millimeter at the height of the ozone hole. All life on Earth depends on this vulnerable gas, and it is by no means plentiful. While ozone is essential for keeping harmful UV rays from reaching the Earth's surface, it is actually toxic to us in large quantities. Under conditions of heavy smog, impurities in the air can allow the sunlight to form ozone close to the ground. In the troposphere, the lowest level of the atmosphere, ozone is able to damage lung tissue and plants. So what's the ozone hole and how exactly did we find it? The ozone hole is often considered the same as the issue with global warming. While both involve the greenhouse effect, they are indeed very different. In the 1970s, the British Antarctic Survey was investigating the atmosphere over Antarctica when they noticed that the lower stratosphere had lost ozone. At first, they thought that their instruments had been faulty. By 1985, the ozone hole was confirmed, and a decline of 50% of ozone was recorded above Halley Bay Station in Antarctica. This caused the Montreal Protocol in 1987, which worked to reduce the use of ozone-depleting materials. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are at fault for the destruction of the ozone layer. The discovery of this hole set off efforts toward banning these chemicals. Some of you may be wondering how exactly CFCs can cause so much damage. Rewinding to 1956, British scientists began researching the ozone layer in Halley to try and understand how it absorbs solar energy. They noticed that it followed a regular seasonal pattern. In the spring, amounts of ozone began to fall until it reached a minimum in October. Then it rose again until it hit a maximum in spring. CFCs came from refrigeration, industrial solvents, and fire control in the northern hemisphere. Over the tropics, these gases break down from solar radiation and circulate toward the poles. Only in the winter can clouds form in the ozone layer over the Antarctic, causing chemical reactions to convert chlorine into an active form. Once sunlight returns, this active chlorine breaks up ozone molecules by stealing one of their oxygen atoms. Just one chlorine, bromine, or nitrogen molecule can literally destroy thousands of ozone molecules. This process destroys the ozone at 1% per day, creating a hole. As it warms, the clouds disappear and the hole begins to repair itself, but not enough to undo the damage. So we've got all that, but why do we care? What would happen if we lost the ozone layer? It's much scarier than getting a couple of extra sunburns. The most dangerous part about losing it would be the increase of exposure to solar radiation, specifically UVB rays. These can severely damage plants, wildlife, and human health. It can also penetrate the ocean's surface up to 90 feet below the surface, harming marine life forms and destroying ecosystems across the globe. The intensity of the sun's radiation would make photosynthesis impossible for almost all plants. The only ones that would survive would be the ones that are largest and slowest growing. As a result, the entire food chain would collapse. Losing the ozone layer over Antarctica has also caused harm to various Antarctic marine plants and animals like plankton. UVB hurts the reproduction of fish, larvae, phytoplankton, and other animals that form the bases of the oceanic food web. In Antarctica alone, losing marine phytoplankton would wreak havoc on curl populations, which feed fish, squid, penguins, seals, and whales. Phytoplankton are also important in that they absorb CO2 and release oxygen. It's not known how much they contribute, but leaving more CO2 in the atmosphere would not help the global warming issue. Skin cancer rates would of course soar, but many of us wouldn't live long enough to die from it. Not only that, but our DNA itself would be severely damaged. The ozone hole might seem to be only above Antarctica, but this is not the case. In 1987, the levels of ozone over Australia and New Zealand dropped by 10%. In just three weeks, 20% more ultraviolet radiation reached these parts, and there was a reported rise in cases of skin cancer and damaged food crops. The ozone hole discovery was indeed very frightening. Ozone is continuously created and destroyed in the atmosphere, but man-made chemicals interrupt this cycle. It only goes to show us just how much of an impact man-made chemicals can have on the atmosphere. Activities outside of Antarctica are what cause most harm to the continent because CFCs from the Northern Hemisphere are the main cause of the problem. In 1996, the hole was 20 million kilometers squared. However, its largest area ever was in 2006. But the story does have a happy ending, for now. Members of the Montreal Protocol managed to stop 95% of all emissions of CFCs. As of 2010, over 190 UN member states have pledged to follow these rules, banning the production and usage of these harmful chemicals among other functions. Now, this important barrier is on the road to recovery. 
It's expected to repair itself by 2070. We've managed to save the ozone layer. We know we have the power right now to take action and save our planet. Let this serve as a message to us all. We can protect the planet.